Hello to you, tabletop enthusiast. I'm Celine, brand and community manager for Game on Tabletop, the crafting platform for gamers by gamers. I am back with a new video for our YouTube series around the project where we interview different actors from the board game and the crafting industry. This time, I'm not the one doing the interview. No, nope, it is Laura Hoffman, Game on CEO. We'll be interviewing Jamie Stegmaier, who is a board game designer and co-founder of Stonemaier Games. You will see that most of the interview will be done in the form of a podcast, but don't worry, it doesn't make it less interesting. Without further ado, let's dive straight into the interview. Well, hey, Jamie, nice to have you here. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. It's exciting to talk to you. I'm, I'm in St. Louis, you're in France, but uh, yeah, it's nice that we can talk in real time this way. I'll let you introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people already know you, uh, but there might still be some that don't. And I'm sure you're the best person to encapsulate who you are, what you do, uh, and yeah, what you're passionate about. Sure. Um, so I, I, like you said, I'm, my name is Jamie Stegmeyer, and I run a company called Stonemeyer Games. I've run this company for about nine years now. I've been a lifelong tabletop gamer and game designer for fun. And then back in 2011, I decided to design a game specifically to put on a crowdfunding platform. Um, and for about five years, that was what I did. I designed games, uh, I, I put them on crowdfunding. And then in 2015, after we crowdfunded a big game called Scythe, we decided to move away from crowdfunding and publish things, not necessarily in the traditional sense, but to carry over all those things that I learned from crowdfunding. Um, and uh, and the communities that we built and did things our own way after that through a different a different pre-order system on our website. I write a lot about crowdfunding and Kickstarter and entrepreneurship, and I also have a board game design YouTube channel. Awesome! So there's a lot of stuff, and indeed uh, there's a lot of things that I think are personally very very interesting, especially like why crowdfunding and what did you bring out of it, and tr how does this translate into other ways of uh, sales and marketing? So we'll talk more about that. So I know I'm very well aware about your blog. Obviously, a lot of people in this industry are. Everybody should read it. You will definitely find the link in our description. Uh, it's great. You also wrote a book about crowdfunding, uh, which I'd recommend to everybody um, anyway. And obviously, you are a publisher of many successful games. You talked about that a bit. Um, but it's games that we see in all the stores that are played day to day. So two big passions uh, that go very well hand in hand. But where did it start out? So what kicked it off? Did you start out with crowdfunding or with publishing tabletop games? Was there one that started out before the other? I would say, I mean, the, the original passion was just in game design. I, I was really excited by game design, but I've also, ever since I was a little kid, I've been excited by the idea of someday running my own business or having some sort of entrepreneurial activity. And the thing that, uh, about crowdfunding that sparked me to actually act on it, other than seeing some tabletop games on Kickstarter back in like 2010, 2011, was the idea that I could know the names and know and have like connections and relationships with my customers directly. I loved that idea of crowdfunding that you can, when you when someone backs their project, you see their name pop up. You're like, okay, Laura backed my project. That's awesome. Who is Laura? How can I, how can I get to know her better? And why is she excited about my project? I loved that idea and that that was kind of what sparked me to take this passion for game design and do something with it. Awesome, awesome, yeah. I think it's also the, the other way around, right? For backers, it's the same. It's not just I, I bought a, a game from some, uh, some stranger company, I bought a game from somebody <laughs> trying to fulfill their dream. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's smart to see it, that it's in both ways. So I think it was like 2012 when you, when you launched your first tabletop crowdfunding campaign. So come to think of it, that's nearly 10 years ago now. <laughs> uh, how would you describe the crowdfunding tabletop era back then? D would you say it's different from what we have now? I would say, yeah, I would say it's, it's quite different than, than what we have now. Um, like now we have multiple platforms that you can consider. We have, we have Game on Tabletop, we have GameFound, we have Kickstarter. Um, maybe those are, I would say, are, are the big three for tabletop games. Indiegogo, I don't, I don't know if people use that as much anymore ta for tabletop games. I don't pay attention to it as much. But back then it was Kickstarter and Indiegogo was kind of trying to make a name for themselves. But there are also a lot fewer projects, especially in the tabletop space. So many less projects on Kickstarter at the time. Like I think on the day that Viticulture launched in, in, I think it was either August or September of 2012, it may have been the only tabletop game project that launched on that day. Whereas now you might have dozens of games, maybe even more launch on the same day. Uh, so just the size has changed a lot. 
And also, I think the level of professionalism has also improved a lot. If you go back and look at that original Viticulture project, it doesn't look nearly as professional, I think, as, as our later projects or and especially as many of the projects you see launched today. Um, and so would you, would you say you'd rather you regret the old times, right? Would you rather be back then and see more of that, how it was back then? Or do you appreciate where it comes today and think that a healthy and good evolution of what started out, like you said, a bit more built together, DIY-like from uh, different creators? A little bit of both for me. I really admire that level of professionalism that we have in projects today. I think that's wonderful, I, I, especially given that I, I spend a lot of money on Kickstarter projects. And so I am more discerning now than I once was as a backer. And I kind of need more signs that I can trust a creator now than I did back then because there are so few projects. At the same time, I feel very lucky and fortunate that Stillmire Games started in 2012 because if I had launched that same Viticulture project now, it probably wouldn't have funded. And so I'm kind of, I feel lucky about that timing. So I'm glad there were fewer projects back then. I'm glad I was lucky enough to get in back then. And the one other thing, I'm, I'm actually curious about your thoughts on this. One thing that I've noticed that seems a lot different now than it was then is uh, the, uh, this is going to sound a little negative and I don't want it to be negative, but I think it is a little negative and maybe it needs some addressing is the level of uh, toxicity and sometimes entitlement that seems very prevalent these days. That was not the case in 2012. It was very different. There was very much less uh, toxicity back then. I'm curious what you've seen now. And I guess if you don't mind me asking, like what, uh, how that works on Game On Tabletop, how, what creators can do when they see that level of toxicity happening. Obviously, I'll talk from the Game On perspective more than maybe from other platforms. Uh, it's, it is true that there might have been a raise. I would still say that like our community is, is still super open and, and obviously it can happen that there is a lot of toxicity going on and that it, it becomes, uh, yeah, creators are uh, sometimes held accountable, which is a good thing. And sometimes they're just getting a bit <laughs> trashed, which is which is way more difficult, I think. Uh, so in our space, it's still healthy, I'd say. Uh, obviously, sometimes there are, there are elements that just go too far. Um, I also think uh, it's kind of like uh, normal in some cases because obviously creators need to be held accountable they need to be <laughs> able to prove that they're that they're going in there with um, with a good spirit what i still see is that some companies still manage to help uh, hold up a good level of interaction with the community and that they do have a very healthy community so it's also something that i think you can sometimes observe uh, all around the internet with different creators whether it's youtube or twitch sometimes you will also come to communities that are very toxic uh, and sometimes they aren't um, and and sometimes it's really really difficult to understand so we've had projects on game on where there have been so much hate or so much uh, things that even I couldn't really understand and I don't think anybody ever understood why on these projects particularly that happened kind of like the good thing is that creators should be aware of the fact that this is going to be a real project. I think what 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 motivated you kind of like going into that direction? I think when I, what I'm hearing is that you're interested by the entrepreneurship um, and that's great and I think that's helped you a lot. Uh, some creators go in there and they're not really ready or that's not really what they're interested in and so lots of mistakes can be made. Um, but I think it's important for them to understand that well, you're launching a project, you're gonna need to fulfill, you're gonna need to be there uh, and so you're gonna be held accountable for that too. And obviously we are sensitive to the way uh, if ever it like goes beyond, right? We would always remove people that are really harassing or, or building news or stuff like this so we will try to be also there to kind of create a, a good environment for creators and backers it's an issue that we experience a bit less I think than it might be on some other platforms right now that's awesome um, yeah and I, I like uh, two things that, that I really like about what you said you use the word accountable a number of times and I, I agree a lot of it comes back to the creators and the second thing is tied to that the idea that the creator has a pretty big impact on like the tone of the community. A creator can't control everything there, but uh, if a creator is trying to, is transparent and communicative, and they kind of foster that positive energy, the community kind of follows that. Whereas if I've seen creators who don't do that, and that's where the toxicity really seems to creep in in a, in a big way. So I like that you're putting a lot of emphasis on the creator itself, and you're right, they, they do have a lot of control in terms of how toxic a project can become. 
Yeah, yeah, and then uh, I think uh, I, it might be different, like I said, in different ecosystems, um, and you, you need to adapt. And it's not always the fault of uh, anybody or specifically the creator. But yeah, I've also seen even like in, in, in environments that stood out, uh, started out very toxic, uh, that the creator was able to make their project in a way that the community then was able to also change um, and acknowledge that. And I think that's always uh, important. Now, obviously, I'd like to also state to everybody who's backing a project, keep in mind there are real people behind <laughs> those projects. Yeah, the, the goal is not to hurt anybody there, even though if, obviously you're, it's le legitimate to ask questions. It's kind of like uh, makes me think about another subject that I think is always super interesting uh, to talk about with the creators I work with is uh, it's about success. Uh, because basically when you look at the different projects that you ran. I'm sure uh, Site is the most uh, <laughs> successful one, financially speaking, right? But uh, I think uh, success is something personal. Uh, and I'd be super curious to know how would you define success and taking away just the financial aspect, which project that you launched would you consider the most successful for you personally? I like the way you phrase that because for, for me, um, like my goal and my mission in everything that I do is to bring joy to tabletops worldwide. And there's a lot in that statement. It, it, the focus is joy. It's also focused on tabletops specifically. You know, there's lots of ways that we can bring people joy. I'm focusing on games on tabletops and worldwide. So not just in the US. And so like very early on, one of my focuses was figuring out how to fulfill projects worldwide in a way that is sustainable for both the backer and the creator. I think Viticulture may have been one of the first projects ever to use multiple fulfillment centers around the world rather than ship from one place. So that's really important. The project that comes to mind maybe a little bit, I mean, Viticulture is really dear to my heart because it was the first one, but Between Two Cities project, which I think was in 2014, is also really, really important to me in terms of that mission that I just described and also the fact that it was the first project for a game that wasn't designed by me. So it was our step of, we're no longer just a self-publishing company, but also we're looking outside at many of the amazing designers around the world who are way more talented than I am. And making one of their games as part of the Stonemaier Games universe. And so that, that project between two cities, I think accomplished those goals and, and leveled up our company in a special way. Yeah, I think it's, it's super important to note those smaller milestones, right, that are maybe more yeah. hidden to the global public, but I think they're really, really important and they, they forge you into what you become. So when you look at your uh, timeline of crowdfunding campaigns, are there things that you would say uh, stand out in the way uh, of how you started out with the smaller campaigns and brought you to more and more success, right? Obviously, we all know a lot of things go in there, but are, for you personally, you would you say there are some things that did stand out and make a significant a difference? Well, one of the things that I think helped us a lot over the course of the, the seven crowdfunding projects that we had was a level of consistency. I think this is really, really important for any creator who is running more than one project. So like consistency in terms of delivering very close to the estimated delivery date. I know that's not always possible now. There are a lot of factors out of creator's control, especially these days with uh, manufacturing, freight shipping being, being very different, very crowded. But like, I think it really helped our second project, Euphoria, that we delivered Viticulture when we said we were going to deliver it. So we kind of built that first level of trust. Hey, we, we're going to do what we said we're going to do. And then we did the same with Euphoria. And really, for every, pretty much every project, we either delivered on time or early. And for the one project I can think of that we weren't able to do that, that we got a little behind on, I asked backers, I said, look, I was really hoping to get this project to you by Christmas. I think this was for Tuscany or maybe the treasure chest. So I was, I was hoping to get this to you in time for Christmas. That isn't going to happen right now. But if you really want it for Christmas, I'm willing to air freight the game, air freight pallets of the game, and then fulfill them early. And so I kind of put it in the hands of backers. Is this really important to you? And for about, I don't know, 300, 400 backers, they said, yeah, I was really hoping to have this by Christmas. And so we did it. We air freighted pallets of games to fulfillment centers and fulfilled them. And for the other backers, we shipped them via ocean freight. So I guess it all comes down to trust, I think, a lot in crowdfunding. These levels of consistency of delivering on time, delivering quality products, we kind of tried to hit that time after time to build that trust and keep that trust. I think it's really hard to maintain and keep that trust. I absolutely agree with you. Trust is a word that's echoing a lot of with me and especially uh, for crowdfunding, uh, it's super, super important. Uh, I'm sure all everybody listening to this interview is going to ask, 
but what's your secret then to deliver on time? <laughs> and I'm not sure there's going to be a magic formula that you can give out to other people, but maybe you have something to share in that subject. I actually do. I do have a magic secret for that. It doesn't work for every project. The thing that I did is that I tried to have, not for Viticulture this wasn't the case, but the projects that followed, I tried to have everything done uh, before we launched the project. I tried to have the game design done, I tried to have the graphic design done, the art done or almost done. Um, I tried to have all the samples ready for the manufacturer, the quotes from the manufacturer. So I'd already done everything. It wasn't, these weren't just ideas. This was something that I had fully executed. I was ready to go to print with it. I know that's not always possible, but that's a big part of the secret. If you have a, a lot of everything done, then you have a lot less uncertainty about whether or not you can find the the right artist or you can get the game design right all that stuff that happens later so did you never fall into the trap of adding the extra bonus stretch goal that wasn't calculated or wasn't ready but everybody wanted and you wanted to do uh, did you ever fall into that trap or never oh no, no i i did i did definitely many times as i got more experience with crowdfunding i did a better job of planning ahead for the stretch goals and kind of anticipating what people would want more of but i think that's one of the joys of crowdfunding that the, the backers come up with a lot of ideas. Some of them don't work, but some of them are really, really cool and having a little bit of flexibility. And I think that's where like, if, if I've already done most of the work on a game, that there is a little bit of wiggle room for those really cool ideas to add those really cool ideas when backers think of them. So the only danger, is, one example that I give is with Viticulture, the first Viticulture campaign, I had a stretch goal for metal coins. Metal coins came up as an idea during the project. And metal coins, I think are too expensive to be a stretch goal. And so that would have had a, a pretty damaging impact on Stillmire Games if we had actually reached that stretch goal, but we didn't reach it, fortunately. And I kind of learned my lesson there that I, I need to be careful about the things that I add to stretch goals because they can have a big impact on the budget and the timeline, as you said. Yes, yes. It's not always easy to make the right call, but sometimes you have to, even though you really, really want to do those metal coins, maybe, but sometimes it's better not to and maybe release them in another way uh, later on. Oh, another question that I, uh, I think is very interesting, I know you are very involved in... I don't know, of all the parts, but most of the parts of your company, of the crowdfundings, of the games, uh, and uh, I think even more so at the beginning. Uh, but how did it look like during the period where you were running crowdfunding games? Did you have people that you would still call your team? Uh, did you delegate stuff? Uh, yeah, were the people gravitating around that? And how did you interact with these people? I like that question a lot. For the first like eight years of, of Stillmire Games, it was primarily just me. I mean, it was me running some of our games. I did have a, I have a business partner that helped co-found the company, but Alan, Alan is mainly like my go-to play tester. He isn't involved with customer service or, or communities, although he was help for a long time. He did help out with the replacement parts. You know, whenever like a game, someone who receives a game and they were sent a card or something, he would send that. So he did that part of customer service. But for the most part, I, I was the project manager for the company. So I would outsource things like I would outsource the art to somebody else. I would outsource the, the graphic design, but I would be the, the, the pinpoint, the hub for those communications and making sure things get done. But I like that you mentioned the idea of a team because even though I was the hub, the person doing, you know, writing the emails, reading the comments, all those things, designing the games for a long time, there was still, I, I was amazed by the number of people who showed up on crowdfunding projects who wanted to help. Like that to me was just incredible. Another thing, I just love that about crowdfunding, that people show up not only just wanting to back something and get something cool, but to actively help make it better is incredible. And so there were so many backers that I would say are part of that team. And one of them in particular, Morton, Morton later became part of our team because he was so helpful with Viticulture and so passionate about solo game design that we ended up hiring Morton. And, and Morton is now like revolutionized, I think in many ways, what solo game design is in games. He created the Automa system that we see in many, many games now. And so th that came from like, that was Morton literally just showing up on a project and saying, I want to help. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Do you see that on, on, on crowdfunding on Game On? A lot. Yes, obviously you can I can see that and also the project that I might have been running obviously I have uh, people that I'm still in touch with now and <laughs> that are that sometimes became part of uh, the team but uh, yeah what you're highlighting there is, is just amazing. It's, uh, it also underlines the story why crowdfunding is a bit different from some other sales channels because 
uh, things like this obviously can also hope uh, happen just through I don't know convention presence or stuff like this but the crowdfunding does give you uh, access to an adventure that is apart and that is very rare to be as close to um, and I also really really like that uh, when I <laughs> kind of triggered you with the word team uh, what came to your mind is the fact that uh, maybe you didn't have like a real established team as, as you might see in a regular company but that you can project this to those people around that. I obviously often tell people right if you want to go into that uh, you need to be aware that you need to do a lot of different things and things that in many companies are sometimes split between different people so do you have someone who can work with you in that and some don't right um, and so obviously I try to encourage them but I also acknowledge that for them it's gonna be a way way bigger feat to actually accomplish it because what you've been doing and what they might be facing uh, yeah, it needs real big shoulders uh, to carry all of that. Um, and so it's, it's a great uh, perspective of hope, I think, to see uh, a team could be different, right? A team could maybe also be the people that will support you and the things that you don't have around you, you might, <laughs> might be finding them this way. So yeah, I think that's a really great, powerful statement. To tag on to the end of that is that uh, even though my co-founder, Alan, even though he only does a few very specific things, that partnership at the very beginning was really, really important for Stillmire Games to exist. Specifically in that I had this game and I was asking friends to play test it with me. And I every time I asked a friend to play test it with me, I would feel a little bad because I'm asking them when we could be sitting down to play a game that works, that is great, that is already published. But instead of we're playing, you know, my, my scrap paper prototype that I know isn't that fun for anyone. But Alan was the only one who emailed me the ne next day and said, hey, like, I really enjoyed that process. I really enjoyed playtesting this with you. I want to do that more. And so I no longer felt guilty. Like he was someone that I could go to and not feel guilty about it and feel good and feel excited to get it to the table with him. So just that little bit of partnership, like that that little specific element was so helpful and helped to make Stillmire Games a company. Absolutely, I 100% agree with you. You need your mental health ecosystem around you. So you ran your crowdfunding campaigns on an external platform that was not your own website. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that today you ran lots of your own pre-orders on your own website. I think it's a different experience because basically the platform becomes like a third party <laughs> service. Uh, how do you, where do you see the place of a crowdfunding platform in the whole? Uh, adventure. Uh, what does it bring to the table? What what is this important? Is it different to make it on your own website? Yeah. Do you have something that you you can share on that? Yeah, that's an that's an interesting question because for a long time now we've used an e-commerce platform called Shopify. But Shopify, it, it you know it's, it's a platform and we apply we put our stuff on it. Shopify isn't actively involved in the same way that Game On is actively involved with your creators. I don't know, it's very different. Like when I think of Game On, when I think of GameFound and Kickstarter, those platforms I think are, um, are they're so catered towards the specific crowdfunding plot process and they are destinations for a wide variety of people to go to. I see them as destinations really. Whereas like our web store, a lot of people who go to our web store go there because I tell them it's there. There are people who already actively follow Stillmeyer Games and or they go to our website and they see that that's our web store. I don't quite know how to differentiate those two things, but it's I feel like if we if if we ever wanted to capture a much bigger audience than the people who already follow us, that that's where the crowdfunding project hubs are so important. Whereas now we're mostly catering to the people who already know what Stillmire Games is and know where to find us. Does that make sense? I, I, don't, I haven't thought about it for a long time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I think it's also very interesting. I think I, probably what you're gaining about the fact of having your own Shopify system is uh, the fact that you can craft it to what uh, Stillmire Games means. Um, and I think at some point for a business that might also have some, its importance. Uh, so maybe that also helps what, what do you think is important in a crowdfunding uh, platform, right? I mean, also now because there are more and more different platforms out there, obviously, but kind of like what is uh, something that really resonates with you and that you would be like, like the first thing you look for in a platform? I have to answer that at least partially as a backer because from those platforms now I am mostly a backer. I, I like, uh, one thing I like is that there are different, the kind of the sidebar of different reward levels. That to me is really helpful as a backer and as a creator, knowing that on a crowdfunding campaign, you can offer like a basic version of the product and then maybe a more deluxe version or like a customized version, things like that. So having those all in one place, I, I really like. I also really like being able to see the 
the funding goal and how the funding, the number of backers and how much money the project has raised. That to me, I, it, there's something helpful about that number that helps, it goes back to trust a little bit. If I see a project that, that is doing really well, I'm like, oh, it must be doing really well for a reason. I need to dig deeper. I need to see what's going on here. Yeah. You, you gravitate to where the crowd already is, obviously. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, the obvious question. Uh, so you did, ran most of your projects uh, for a while on crowdfunding, um, and then you stopped doing crowdfunding. Uh, do you mind sharing why this de decision was uh, important for you and uh, yeah, what, ha what it has brought to your business? Yeah, there, there were a couple major reasons behind doing it. And looking back now, one of the reasons that, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you two answers because one answer was kind of the thing that happened back in 2016. And one is the reason that I haven't returned to it. The reason, one of the big reasons that I ended up uh, moving away from it is tied to actually mental health, something that you mentioned earlier, and also tied to toxicity with the backers. Side is a fairly unique project in that it did very well when it was on Kickstarter and everything in terms of production and fulfillment went better than planned. Like it, it did way better than we thought it would. It, it was, I don't know, I'm, I'm biased, but I think it was a, ended up being a beautiful production. Like people got the thing that they thought they were getting. Somewhat objectively, I can say that it ended up being a game that uh, people liked a lot. Like it's very highly ranked on Board Game Geek. It was not like a, a game that just looked pretty, but was not actually good. I, I feel weird saying that because I'm the designer, but you know, we, we have those stats now to back it up a little bit. And the last part was the fulfillment. We fulfilled early for Scythe, two months early for some regions. And yet, despite all those things going so well, during the fulfillment process, it was as if, like, reading the comments from backers, it was as if everything was terrible and horrible. And it was a very odd, surreal time because I was like, we're, we're delivering this thing to you as we said it was going to be, and even better than we said it was going to be, and we're delivering it early, and you're still finding something to be angry about. Things like, uh, like the example that I've given in the past is that there were backers in California in the U.S. who were fairly close to, th to the fulfillment center, who were angry that the fulfillment center, which had thousands of games to fulfill, they were angry that the fulfillment center was sending games to the east coast of the U.S. first because they would take longer to get there. And while those games were in transit, the fulfillment center was going to send games to California. And this was like a significant number of backers who were irate. Their games weren't shipped to them first, even though it, like we were delivering early. Like they were getting the game a month and a half earlier than we ever said they would. And they, they couldn't wait like three days for those people in New York to get their copy. I don't know. I it was really damaging to me. Like I look back at that summer, it should have been like one of the best summers of my life because we were delivering this thing that meant so much to me to people around the world. And yet it, it was it was so toxic. It was so odd to me. It got, like you were talking about accountability earlier. Like we had held up our end of the bargain and backers were still so toxic and, and anger. And I think a lot of it comes from, they, they were passionate. They were excited about the game. I get that, but you don't have to turn that into something negative. And so that really stuck with me, that, and that really turned me away from whatever manifested there. I, I do have the other thing I wanted to say, but I, do you have any thoughts about that story? Yes, I absolutely. Uh, I first wanted to share that I'm really sorry that you went through that. I can only fathom to imagine uh, what it what that looks like, right? Because nobody who isn't in your situation can really uh, comprehend that. But I know what toxicity on the internet is like and uh, what it can be like for crowdfunding uh, campaigns. So yeah, I think that's the saddest which can uh, happen. I agree with you that it's probably linked to the passion that the uh, people had for the game and the excitement, uh, but that doesn't excuse the, the behavior, right? To see, and I definitely understand that. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's important. And I think maybe there needs to be more discussion about uh, protecting your mental health and <laughs> your uh, safe spaces in crowdfunding because it gets very, very intense. And I think it's important to shed light on that too. I completely agree. Yeah, in, in many different ways. That's just one example of how a, a, a mental, a mental health is important in crowdfunding. Many other different examples too. The second thing that is tied to that, the reason that I haven't returned to it, as excited as I get as a backer for crowdfunding campaigns, I truly do love crowdfunding. But the reason that I haven't returned is I am completely hooked on our current system which is that instead of making something and then asking people to pay for it and then 
adding six to eight to 12 months before we actually send it to them. In our current system, we make a thing that we are really excited about. And then when it is very close to, when it's fully manufactured and has already shipped to fulfillment centers, that's when we announce it to people. And then a few weeks later, we let them pre-order it. And then a few weeks later, we ship it to them. And I, I'm very fortunate to be, I know not every creator, not every, definitely not every creator, definitely not every publisher can do that, but I'm very fortunate to be in the position to be able to, to fund that. And I love it. I love that we can announce something and get people excited about it. And then a few weeks later, they can have it in their hands already. And so I'm entirely hooked on that system. And that, that's what's made it really hard for me to go back to crowdfunding as much as I love uh, crowdfunding platforms or crowdfunding campaigns. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, great to hear too, because I mean, like you said, uh, you are very fortunate. And on one hand is that you might be financially stable enough to be able to produce that because you need the finances, but also you really have a very good hand on producing awesome games and um, uh, that uh, also helps. I mean, there is never a no risk situation and I know probably some games do better for you than others do, uh, but still, right, you, you constantly uh, produce uh, quality uh, experiences so um, that's also great because you kind of know okay you're gonna get people in excited and you will be able to build something um, but yeah I think it's also I think it's it's very important to know when crowdfunding fits best for you crowdfunding should not be like I'm doing crowdfunding because I'm doing crowdfunding right it should be because your project needs it you need it and it's the right thing to do in the right right spot so I I think it's smart to know also when maybe something else will work best. Are there lessons that you think you learned through crowdfunding and that still apply, apply today and that help you today in the way you handle things now? Oh yeah, so many, so many. And that's one of the reasons I still like write a lot about crowdfunding because I still learn so much from crowdfunding creators. From the beginning of this conversation, I talked about being able to connect with people one-on-one, -on -one, maybe not have like full relationships with people, but to be able to interact one-on-one -on -one with people like I did on, on Kickstarter and crowdfunding, I still try to do that. Like we have Facebook groups for each of our games now that I am very active in and that someone who is passionate about one of our, our games, they can join that Facebook group and be part of that community. So we took that community aspect that I loved on crowdfunding and have these game specific groups on Facebook that we now use. That's just one example, but that really the, the element of community, I think is what stuck with me the most. Building this community of people that I can engage with and talk with and hopefully make our projects, products better and make our company better um, by listening to them. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's great. Uh, I always talk about succeeding in your crowdfunding campaign is like uh, yeah, you raised enough money to make it, but it's about the long term success <laughs> because you need to fulfill it, and it in the best case scenario it stays in in the shelves. But what you talk about it uh, too is uh, being successful and building your audience is building not only a crowdfunding audience but building a, an audience that will follow you, <laughs> whatever you do. Right? Is kind of like it's the long term success in audience building. How would you describe the pl place of crowdfunding today? in our tabletop industry as a whole. It's, it's a big part of the industry now. In fact, I just uh, yesterday, I sent out our annual demographic survey. I don't have it handy in front of me, but I was looking at some of the data that was coming in because one of the questions I asked is, what is your primary place for buying games? Or in the past year, what was your primary place for buying games? And crowdfunding was a huge part of it. I think it was second only to online game stores. So it was online game stores and then crowdfunding. So crowdfunding was even bigger than, than buying from like local game stores according to, to this survey. Uh, so I think it's been a, become a huge part of the gaming infrastructure and the tabletop industry infrastructure. I don't know exactly how this plays into it, but I think maybe one of the key reasons why it persists and why it's so important is the element of anticipation and excitement. I think there's a different level of anticipation. Like if, if a publisher announced a game tomorrow, it's quite possible I will get excited about that game. But there's something about being part of that, about the creation of something new, rather than finding out something that has already been created. That I think is really, really special. And being able to be a part of that excitement and that anticipation for something that will be created, that is in the process of being created, is really, really exciting. So I think that still plays that plays an even bigger role today in the gaming industry than it ever did. What about you? I mean, you, you th probably think about this every day. What's the biggest thing that you see? I mean, I might be biased because I really work on that <laughs> so, so intensely, but for me, definitely uh, crowdfunding would be, um, uh, I'd, I'd consider it a, a real legitimate sales channel today in the tabletop industry uh, obviously different and maybe not the same scope as like the really yeah mass market retailers uh, that, that sell yeah some of the very very well-known games obviously we might be still far from some of the quantities there but i mean there are a couple of projects <laughs> that are doing really really well crowdfunding and so 
Yeah, that's super interesting. So I think uh, crowdfunding is something that is established now in this industry um, and still the core for crowdfunding for me at least is uh, innovation and I hope that this can persist. I think crowdfunding can only exist with innovation. Uh, I think it's very, uh, yeah, if, if ever it like gets too stuck in, in, in one part and then something that we were able to yeah, notice over the past years, sometimes there's like a new trend and a way of doing your campaigns that comes out and then like everybody will build exactly the same campaigns. But still, trends are still moving along, they're still uh, changing uh, and I think that's important. I think crowdfunding is about uh, innovation and uh, it's about risk taking too, right? I mean, the very first pe people who started out crowdfunding and even like you back in 2012, it wasn't as assured as it is today. Um, and so you kind of had to go in there um, and, uh, and innovate and take risks to make this happen. And I think this kind of needs to stay in there. Uh, I think it also gets a bit more uh, personal. I think uh, creators take the project really into their own hands and say, hey, I want to run crowdfunding campaigns this way and this is important for me. That's something that we are confronted with every day at Game On is adapting to every special need of every creator and they're so different, like no creator <laughs> works the same way. Um, and I think there are more bold moves now with the tools that are used, the platforms that are used, the people that are interact with, uh, uh, the different um, yeah, services that are added, used, uh, and there's more yeah, connection uh, in there too. There is no question now that for the gaming industry at least, it's uh, a real sales channel it generates. A lot of fun. And I think a lot of that ties back to uh, new creators. If I was a new creator who wanted to both design a game and run a company, I would absolutely crowdfund my first project because you mentioned risk in your in your in your answer there. Like you can mitigate a lot of that risk with the funding goal. If I'm really excited about something, but I don't know if other people are equally excited about it, uh, crowdfunding is the greatest way I think to test that to see if other people are excited enough to justify you actually making this project. So for new creators, I think crowdfunding it continues to be amazing. So is there anything you would love like to see in the next years for crowdfunding? Do you have like uh, stuff that you, maybe it's, maybe it's secret because you want to <laughs> bring that to the table, but yeah, things you, you'd love to see in a crowdfunding campaign, on a platform. I don't know if I have anything that uh, specific. You answered it, I think, a second ago with innovation. I love seeing people do new things. That That's what typically gets me excited when someone does something a little, little different, a, new, a different technique on a project or a different element of a game or product. That's what really gets me excited. Anything unique and innovative uh, is really, really exciting to me. But I also like seeing, like if, if you were asking me like what I would like to see crowdfunding platforms do, Game On is already doing one of those things, which is having like the automized uh, stretch goal system, having that built into the system rather than something that creators need to apply to it later. I think it's brilliant. I love that you do that. I like to see crowdfunding platforms innovate and learn and listen to people and, and integrate those things into their platforms. So that's really cool. Yes, yes, obviously kind of like that's what what we try to do every day and yeah I think it's it's important and some of those things should be should become a norm I think so awesome uh, thank you so much for all of those questions uh, I think uh, we've been over time a bit um, but I'd have a final question for you if you're happy to answer that is there something new for you coming up with Stegmaier games maybe or something for you right you're trying out or something you'd like to share with our audience as we're talking right now i don't know when, the, when this video will go live but we do have our pre-order for tapestry arts and architecture right now we just launched it yesterday and uh, we started shipping it today uh, so it's that that style of pre-order so this is our, our new expansion for tapestry that i'm really excited about that wasn't why I, I appeared to talk to you today but i appreciate you asking that and i i am really excited about it too that's a that's awesome it's a great game and and uh, I don't know when this uh, video airs either, but as you're starting shipping, I'm sure it's get, gonna be that just regularly available on your store uh, when people see this video and can dig in and purchase it <laughs> at that point. Awesome, I don't know if you have any anything you wanted to add. I think that I think we've covered some fun topics today, some important topics. I really appreciate your time, everything that you're doing at Game On, and I look forward to talking about it. I know for a while I've been I've been wanting to write about it on the blog, and so I've been waiting for this chat, and so after this goes live, I'm gonna I'm gonna write about about Game On on uh on Samar Games' blog. Awesome, thank you so much. That's very appreciated, obviously, uh, too. It's been a very big pleasure also being finally able to talk to you after being following your adventures for su such a long time. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Yes, bye-bye. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel to follow all our crafting adventures. Make sure to check out Game On Tabletop 
www.crafttipletop.com to discover great tabletop crafting campaigns. I'll see you in another video. Until then, bye-bye.